song was When the Belt in the Lighthouse Rings from the Library of Congress. The lyrics were written by Arthur J. Lamb, and this clip was performed by Frank C. Stanley in 1905. The lyric that we're going to focus on today is, when the bell in the lighthouse rings ding dong, when it clangs with its warning loud and long, then the sailor will think of his sweetheart so true. Do you notice any similarities between these paintings? The ships, the blue skies, the rippling waves. Did you notice anything else? Welcome to Peek in the Paintings. I'm Wilk Shorten, a summer education intern at the Penobscot Marine Museum in Searsport, Maine. Besides the typical nautical imagery, all four of these paintings feature lighthouses somewhere in the painting's background. Some are more obvious than the others. During a journey at sea, sailors moving past or into ports were usually met by a lighthouse, helping them determine where they are. Lighthouses were built along the east coast of the United States as early as the 1700s. First, let's look at this painting of the Black Hawk, which features our most notable lighthouse that we'll be examining today. This piece was painted in 1860. The Black Hawk was a medium clipper ship built in New York by William Webb in 1857. This is a standard ship's portrait. It illustrates every detail of the Black Hawk as it sails. Although the artist depicts the ship itself in great detail, it's important to note that they use sporadic brush strokes to illustrate the ocean below. This method gives the overall painting a special quality and almost makes the ship pop out more to the viewer as we look at it in the entire frame. Note how the artist illustrates the sails. They are all billowed out, indicating wind flow as it cuts across the waters. Although it's hard to tell in this photograph of the painting, the artist puts great detail into illustrating the Black Hawk's rigging, going as far to show that some of the sails are furled and not in use when they created this painting. It is unclear where exactly the artist painted this image of the Black Hawk as it sailed between New York and San Francisco consistently throughout its entire service between 1857 and 1881. What do you think when you think of a lighthouse? When I think of them, I picture a structure similar to this one. A lighthouse's features are easily recognizable upon further inspection. Note the long slim tower and the lantern room at the top of the building. Immediately underneath the lantern room is typically a watch room where the lighthouse's keeper stored oil and backup lanterns and could stand and watch during their shift. A key feature of the lighthouse's lit lantern room is a proper Fresnel lens. This lens is made up of a variety of prisms mounted on a steel frame. This particular arrangement of lenses creates one strong beam, which is imperative to ships sailing at night or in rough seas. In 1811, the French Commission of Lighthouses began an inquiry to improve lighthouse illumination. Augustin Fresnel completed his design of the flashing lens in 1822, which had evolved into the Fresnel lens that we're familiar with today. Although it is indistinguishable in these paintings, almost all lighthouses, modern and historic, are equipped with a Fresnel lens. Next time you're at a lighthouse, be sure to take a look at their lens if you have the opportunity. Here is an image from the Heron Neck Lighthouse, titled Heron Neck Lighthouse with Visitors, located in Vinyl Haven, Maine. 
This photo was taken on July 7th, 1956, and is included in the Carroll Fair Berry Collection at the Penobscot Marine Museum Photo Archives. It shows a fuel tank on the left and a small bell tower on the right. In the background, we see a ship that is anchored offshore. It is likely that this is the Coast Guard. This image is notable in our discussion today, as bells and bell towers are important features of lighthouses and lighthouse grounds. Not all lighthouses had separate bell towers, like the one that is at Heron Neck. Lighthouses were equipped with large fog bells that were used to help ships navigate away from the light shores. Fog bells were common before the use of fog horns, a more modern signaling device. Fog horns emit a loud, low, consistent tone that can be heard from miles offshore. The sound of a fog horn is similar to the horns we sometimes hear on modern ships, like ferries and merchant ships. Nevertheless, historic fog bells also make a loud and deep sound, which is easily distinguishable from afar, say on the board of a ship reaching a rocky shoal. Although there is no bell tower or visible bell in this painting, it is likely that this lighthouse was equipped with one or some other method for alerting sailors approaching the shore. Although we do not know where the lighthouse in this image is specifically, it is unlikely that this outbuilding or the lantern room were truly yellow. It is likely that the author used yellow to accompany the colors of the Black Hawk or to add flair to the overall painting. Nevertheless, lighthouses are usually painted with bright and vibrant colors in order to distinguish themselves on the coast during the daytime. At night, only its light serves as a beacon to guide ships safely to shore. If we look closely at this lighthouse, it appears to be made of brick due to the artist's cross-hatching. It has two four-pane windows below the lantern room. To the left below the tower is a small outbuilding, sometimes referred to as a gallery. This outbuilding is likely the keeper's quarters where they would live during their term at the lighthouse. Outbuildings were usually built as any other building in the area using easily obtainable materials such as stone, brick, or timber. It is likely that this outbuilding had wood shingles on its roof as indicated by the artist crosshatching here. Let's look at our next painting, The Brig, Kentucky. This watercolor was painted in 1833 and features the brig on the sea facing a lighthouse similar to the previous painting of the Black Hawk. The Brig, Kentucky was built in Searsport in 1833 and commanded by Benjamin Carver until 1840. Note the fine details of the ship. We can see the individual yards and running rigging. As with the Black Hawk, this artist also painted the Kentucky with open billowing sails, indicating that it is in movement in this painting. Although the ship's billowing sails and flags make it appear to be in motion, the artist did not paint noticeable waves beneath the brig. Rather, the ocean looks still and almost serene. Note how the artist layers his blues with whites, making the water almost appear reflective. Perhaps the Kentucky is just starting to sail, and that's why the waters aren't moving. If we zoom in here along the ship's deck, we see several individual figures. They appear to be sailors in various stances, some of which seem to be focused on the rigging. Although the details are hard to make out, we can assume that these are sailors operating the ship as it begins to sail. Unlike the Black Hawk painting, the lighthouse in this painting is noticeably different. It has a slimmer tower and it does not have a notable outbuilding. Notice the shapes beneath the right of the lighthouse. Are these ramparts or buildings associated with the land that the lighthouse is on? Let's look at its lantern room. In this painting, the lighthouse's lantern room is slightly more distinct than the last painting. Before modern power mechanisms like gas and solar power, lighthouse keepers were responsible for maintaining the light source in the lantern room. In the 1700s, lighthouses were kept lit by a pyre burning coal or wood. Towards the turn of the century and into the 1800s, lanterns replaced fires in most lighthouses. These lanterns were fueled with oil, ranging from whale oil to kerosene. The lighthouse provides a beacon that warns ships of the coast's edge. It is no surprise that many nautical paintings feature lighthouses, as they are emblematic of a seafarer's journey. Let's look at a quote from The Lighthouses of New England by Edward Rowe Snow and Jeremy de Entremont a book that follows the various histories of New England's many lighthouses. But first, let's look at a photograph. Here is a photograph of one of the Matinicus rock lights from the National Fisherman Collection in the Penobscot Bay Marine Museum's photo archives. Note the brick outbuilding and the tower here and the lantern room here. From Abby Burgess Grant, a lighthouse keeper at the Matinicus rock light. Sometimes I think 
The time is not far distant when I shall climb these lighthouse stairs no more. It has almost seemed to me that the light was part of myself. When we had care of the old lard oil lamps on the Botanicus rock, they were more difficult to tend than these lamps are. Many nights I have watched the lights my part of the night and then could not sleep the rest of the night thinking nervously what might happen should the lights fail. The Matinicus Rock Light was a lighthouse located at the mouth of Penobscot Bay. Abby's father was Samuel Burgress, named keeper of the Matinicus Light in 1853. At this time, it was common for a lighthouse keeper to maintain a light for five to 10 years, if not longer. He moved to the island with his wife and children, including Abby, who was born in 1839. The same year, coincidentally, a rough January storm struck the lighthouse. The keeper at the time wrote a brief record of the storm of which Abby found during her stay in the island. The record cites, lighthouse tore down by the sea on January 27th, 1839. Throughout her father's tenure as keeper, Abby learned about the lighthouse's various operations, including upkeep of the light tower and the outbuildings. Often her father left the island and returned to the mainland for supplies, leaving Abby in charge of her family, the light, and the rock's other operations. After her father stepped down as keeper in 1861, Abby remained on the island and lived with the new keeper's family. Shortly thereafter, she married the keeper's son, Isaac H. Grant. Abby was named assistant keeper of the lighthouse after her marriage. Although most of us associate lighthouse keepers with grizzled captains and perhaps certain characters in contemporary media, Abby's position as a prominent lighthouse keeper at the Matinicus Rock Light is an important note in Maine's history of lighthouse keeping. Abby died in 1892 at the age of 53. Today, her gravestone features a model metal lighthouse commemorating her duties as the lighthouse keeper. The Matinicus Rock Light continued operations until one of its towers was extinguished in 1923. The second tower became automated in 1983. It is not clear where this painting of the Kentucky took place. During its service, it shipped from Maine to Africa to Rio de Janeiro and was employed in the slave trade. Thus, this lighthouse could be located almost anywhere in the world. Let's look at our next painting. This is a watercolor portrait of the Bark Investigator. The Investigator was built in Searsport in 1865 by John Carver and weighed 597 tons. It was owned by Phineas Pendleton, John Carver, Isaac Carver, and others. The Investigator is active from 1856 to 1864 and traveled globally. This painting of the Investigator is a typical ship's portrait. We see it in its entirety, from its bow to its rear. Notice the American flag, painted with lines that curve and ripple, indicating a sea breeze. If we look closer, we note its name, which is painted in blue on the flag above the main sky sail. Next to it is another blue flag, painted with what appears to be stars. This is a traditional Union Jack of the United States, a maritime flag that represents the United States nationality. In the background, we can see another rig, perhaps a small schooner, as indicated by its sails. Notice here the blues used in the ocean and then up here in the skies. The ocean waters are painted to illustrate choppy waters. Do you see the white caps where the investigator is cutting through the waters? The sky up here, on the other hand, is very light. The artist uses blue sparingly and with careful brushstrokes is able to create the appearance of a cloud cover. Below the image of the ship, a script notes that it is being depicted here on the River Gironde in France. Thus, we can assume that the lighthouse to the lower right is a French light. This is the Cordouan Lighthouse. This great historic light sits on a rocky island in the middle of the sea at the mouth of the Gironde estuary off the coast of the Royan and the Grave Headland. The Cordouan Lighthouse, also referred to as the Tour de Cordouan Lighthouse, was built between 1584 and 1611, deeming it the oldest operational lighthouse in France. It is sometimes referred to as the Versailles of the sea and the patriarch of lighthouses due to its great stature and its age. It is 223 feet tall and was built on a round thick base to withhold crashing waves from the rocky sea. Let's look at our final painting, the familiar Eliza J. Pendleton, of which we've discussed in several previous programs. This painting is by a local Maine artist, William Pierce Stubbs, and was completed in 1891. Notice the Fort Point Lighthouse in the background. This painting has some of the finest details among the paintings that we've looked at today. Let's look at the ocean. Do you see the white-capped waves? 
Stubbs layers his blues to give the ocean great depth, making it appear deep and cold. If we zoom out, we can see unique color variation in the skies. He uses muted colors against the blue, which gives the sky a colorful quality. Between the masts, the sky almost seems purple. Could this have been painted before sunset or after sunrise? On the ship itself, we see small figures. They do not seem to be in as much motion as the figures on the Kentucky. These two here at the end seem to just be standing idly, perhaps observing their surroundings. Here we see Fort Point, a peninsula in Stockton Springs that juts out into the Penobscot River. George S. Watson describes Fort Point in his book, Sailing Days on the Penobscot, as follows. Fort Point and its stumpy lighthouse being rounded, most of the vessels drop anchor in the spacious cove on the northern side. Sailors would stop at Fort Point to shelter before traveling onward towards Bucksport or Bangor or elsewhere. They would see the lighthouse's lit lantern room as they approached the fort before they landed to dock. We've discussed Fort Point previously in the series, so we won't talk much more about it today. However, if you're interested in learning more, we've added a link to our previous video. In 1939, the United States Coast Guard took responsibility of America's many lighthouses. Today, the lighthouses that are still in operation do not require lighthouse keepers. Rather, they are kept lit with aero beacons or an air beacon and are lit with electric gas or power. In operating lighthouses, aero beacons are fixed on a motorized platform that rotates within a Fresnel lens. As the motor rotates, the beacon sends a consistent beam of light out into the open air, producing a flashing effect that notifies ships of its location. Discontinued lighthouses that are not functional are maintained by historical societies, nonprofits, state parks, museums, and community groups. Maine itself is home to over 60 lighthouses along the coast, its oldest being the Portland Head Light in Cape Elizabeth, first built in 1791. The Penobscot Marine Museum has a variety of maritime and nautical paintings featuring lighthouses and other marine themes. When we look at nautical and marine art, be sure to keep an eye out for lighthouses and other details that you might miss at first glance. Thank you so much for joining us here today. To conclude, let's take a final look at the paintings and listen to When the Bell in the Lighthouse Rings one more time. Be sure to listen closely for the song's fog bell. Thank you again. For a day is to come, my bonny face, when joy in our hearts shall reign. And we love to think of the danger past when you rest in my arms again. Come back.